So today I'm going to talk about long-acting antiretrovirals. I will not talk about uh, monoclonal antibodies. I will confine the discussion to small molecules. Um, I'll introduce you to the two agents that are currently available, rolpivirine and cabotegravir. I'll then uh, transition into the uh, treatment development program, which is being led by Vive. Um, the drugs are actually produced by both uh, uh, GSK Vive and uh, Janssen. And then finally, uh, talk about prevention, where I've been spending a lot of my time. Uh, cabotegravir is an HIV integrase inhibitor. It's an analog of dolutegravir. Uh, many of you are very familiar with dolutegravir. Um, it is available in both an oral and a long-acting nanosuspension. Rilpivirine, similarly, uh, it's an NNRTI. It's commercially available, as you well know. Um, it's uh, also available as an oral and long-acting nanosuspension. The key to both of these drugs is that they are able to be formulated such that you can give a fair amount of drug in a relatively small volume. And that is why they are amenable to being used as long-acting agents, number one. Number two, this is just the very beginning of long-acting agents because many of the drugs that were put on the shelf years ago because they had bad pharmacokinetics are now being pulled back off the shelves to be looked at again as a potential long-acting agent. So this is a field that is just beginning. So this is the beginning, not the end, so to speak. Just to give you a hint of the PK, this is from a study that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, looking at the PK of long-acting rilpivirine, and you can see at doses of 300, 600, and 1,200 milligrams, there's a clear dose response. But on the x-axis, you can see time in days, and on the y-axis, drug levels, and we'll talk a little bit about the target levels, et cetera. But you can see that this is a very long-acting drug with a very, very long tail, and this does have ramifications for use in both treatment and prevention. Similarly, cabotegravir has a very long tail as well, so on the x-axis, this time is weeks, and on the y-axis are drug levels. And this is a dose ranging in the phase one studies, and you can see quite clearly a dose response. But these are drugs that are very long acting and form a depot when given intramuscularly or subcutaneously. <clears throat> so I'm first going to start uh, uh, talking about treatment. Why do we need alternatives for treatment? And this is a somewhat old slide of the HIV cascade. But it's in a great article by Kilmarks et al. on current opinions in HIV AIDS. And it talks about the leak, so to speak. And despite the fact that we have 1.2 million people infected with HIV in the US where treatment abounds, we have a relatively small number of these people actually suppressed. And it highlights the fact that we need alternatives to daily oral therapy as one of the problems that face us. <clears throat> So let's talk a bit about how long-acting agents are being developed. Um, these studies have been called the LATTE studies by uh, GSK Vive. LATTE 1 was basically a study to establish the feasibility of a two-drug maintenance therapy following three-drug induction. So this is all oral. LATTE 2 is a three-drug oral induction followed by a two-drug intramuscular injection strategy, and I'll give you some of the details that was recently presented at CROI. And then their phase three program is starting in the relative near future, and it will be a three-drug oral induction and a two-drug maintenance therapy in antiretroviral naive patients, and they will also do pivotal switch studies where patients who are already suppressed on oral therapy will then be switched to two-drug intramuscular injection. So those are the basically, that's the uh, development plan that will be coming. And, and I anticipate that the phase three studies will probably be completed somewhere in the range of 12 to 24 months. So here's the study design for LATTE 1. Again, you've seen this study design over and over and over again. It's a phase two study. It's a bit of a dose ranging study. There were uh, basically four arms. Three cabotegravir arms, 10, 30, and 60, and a, fa a Favarin's comparator. There's an induction phase, and at 24 weeks, if few patients were suppressed, they went into the maintenance phase, and the, and the maintenance phase basically was cabotegravir plus rilpivirine. 
So we're establishing a two-drug maintenance as the basis for subsequent drug development. That is essentially why LATTE-1 was done, because frankly, there had not been a lot of data showing an integrase inhibitor plus an NNRTI as effective. Patient population, it was uh, somewhat characteristic for HIV studies done in the United States currently. Um, about, you know, in the 30s, mostly male, mostly Caucasian, relatively modest viral load, healthy CD4 because we're treating most of the patients. And in the Mate study, there was a choice of background nukes, and about two-thirds of the patients were treated with uh, tenofovir FTC, and about a third treated with abacavir 3TC. Here's the virologic data, and I do not want to belabor this in detail, only to say that the patients in the three cabotegravir arms did relatively well at the lowest cabotegravir dose. There were higher numbers of patients who were not suppressed, so the 10 milligram dose was not chosen for development. The 30 and 60 arm were comparable. The 60 arm probably did a bit better virologically, but not as well as far as um, adverse events. And then on the um, uh, uh, second uh, uh, part of the slide, you can see that the patients who entered the maintenance phase remained very well suppressed in both the cabotegravir arms and the efavirenz arms, establishing non-inferiority. One of the problems with using an integrase inhibitor and an NNRTI is the fear of what happens if the patients develop resistance, because you blow two classes if you develop resistance to both the integrase inhibitor and the NNRTI. And in this study, indeed, there were relatively few patients that had drug resistance that was detectable. There was one patient in the 10 milligram arm who did have resistance to both integrase inhibitors and NNRTIs. And then there was another patient, indeed, who had NNRTI resistance in the 10, in the 10 milligram arm. So basically, Vate did establish that um, after induction therapy, cabotegravir and rilpivirine was able to maintain virologic response. Um, the, uh, the virologic response in the 30 milligram was, accept was certainly acceptable. Um, the drugs were well tolerated, and the 30 milligram dose was selected for further uh, development. And this formed the uh, proof of concept for LATTE-2, and LATTE-2 is really the more important treatment study that I'll present now. So the LATTE-2 study design is basically um, um, an induction again, followed by a maintenance. It's a 24-week induction. The only difference here is at the very end of the uh, uh, induction phase for the last four weeks, patients are given oral rilpivirine to rule out hypersensitivity. And it's very important, when you give a depot drug, you cannot take the depot away. So you must have a sense that uh, patients will tolerate the drug. So, they'll t so you're testing their, their uh, ability to tolerate cabotegravir, but at the very end, you're go also going to uh, assess tolerability to rilpivirine. If the patients re were uh, undetectable at week 24, then they were randomized into the next phase. And this was the maintenance phase. And the maintenance phase basically included a once a month injection uh, 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 regimen where the drugs were given cabotegravir 400, rilpivirine 600. So that's uh, two mLs of the cabotegravir, two mLs of the rilpivirine. So it's two two mL injections. And just to also note that on day one, patients did get a loading dose of cabotegravir, two 2 ml injections. So there's a, an extra injection in that arm. There was also an every eight week regimen where the patients were given 800 milligrams of cabotegravir, so that's two 2 ml injections, and rilpivirine, a 3 ml injection, and then another 600 milligrams of cabotegravir four weeks later, and then Four weeks after that, they were given the every eight-week regimen, which was cabotegravir, 600 milligrams IM, or 3 ml, so one 3 ml injection, and a rilpivirine injection, one 3 ml injection. Okay. Now, uh, believe it or not, you can give a 3 ml injection of both cabotegravir and rilpivirine. I remember when I first read these protocols, I kind of thought, are you, are you crazy? <laughs> because you know, if you have ever given procaine penicillin or got a shot of procaine penicillin, you go, wow, that hurts. 
But actually, I'll, as I'll show you, these were not; these were relatively well tolerated. And of course, there was a um, uh, an oral uh, cabotegravir arm, and these were randomized two to two to one. So this is the study population again, um, uh, about the same age as the last A1, mostly male, um, mostly Caucasian, uh, extremely healthy, relatively modest viral load, and a relatively healthy CD4. As one would expect, cabotegravir at 30 milligrams is a very effective uh, integrase inhibitor, and the patients during the induction phase did extremely well with about 90% or so achieving a, um, a viral load less than 50. Um, there were no patients who, achieve, who uh, failed virologically, so the patients, so between 91 and 100% basically were patients who either dropped out due to adverse events or, or dropped out for other reasons. So here's the uh, maintenance uh, period, and you can see the patients start at day one. So the patients who come into the study with viral loads less than 50, some of them blip a little bit, so it's not 100% of the patients starting with viral loads less than 50. That said, it's still basically almost all the patients achieve um, uh, 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 maintenance of their uh, uh, viral suppression, and this is week 32 data into the um, uh, maintenance phase that Dave Margolis presented at this last CROI meeting in Boston. And um, this is uh, basically comparing the uh, Q8 week to the Q4 week to the oral shown on the left side. This is a snapshot looking at the non-responses. And on the right side of the slide, you can see basically um, looking at the response rates, the intramuscular to the right, the oral to the left. And it's quite clear that the 95% confidence intervals are well within the minus 10% establishing non-inferiority of the intramuscular dose doses to the oral. And this is just a summary of the patients. This is again looking at the week 32 snapshot outcomes. Relatively very few patients re, uh, um, did not maintain the virologic response. Um, essentially a one patient in, in the uh, Q8 week and one patient in the oral cabotegravir and neither of these patients had drug resistant virus. So they failed for reasons other than uh, drug resistance. And actually in the, in the Q8 week IM, when the drug levels were measured, there was probably a problem with the intramuscular injections themselves because the real pivoting levels were far lower than should have been had the patient been getting the doses that were supposed to be received. This is perhaps one of the problems that I'll perhaps talk about later. Adverse events. So um, adverse, the uh, intramuscular injections are relatively well tolerated. Compared to oral therapy, you do have a relatively small incidence of flu-like flu symptoms, a little bit of fever, a little bit of muscle aches, et cetera. But in general, extremely well tolerated. And very few patients actually discontinue um, uh, 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 um, the intramuscular injections due to adverse events. So I think this is a very important slide, and I want you all to realize that this is really the first of its, of its type, looking at giving intramuscular injections as antiretroviral therapy. And going into these studies, both for treatment and prevention, one really didn't know if the patients would run for the hills and say this is absolutely terrible, or whether they'll actually stick around and see what the adverse events were. So first of all, um, this is looking at injection site reactions. So what do the patients feel around the places where they're getting their injections? And you can see that injection site reactions are relatively common, at least about half of the time in this treatment study and over 4,000 injections given to the 230 uh, patients. Most of them are mild, 82%. Some of them are moderate, meaning they so somewhat interfere with daily functioning, but very few of them were severe. Note that they were evanescent. They lasted for approximately three days on average. So this is a relatively uh, um, well-tolerated intramuscular injection. Most of the injection site reactions are injection site pain. There are almost no nodules, no swelling, et cetera. Certainly for any of you who had any of the uh, experience with the T20, it is nothing like T20 or Fusion. It is, they're, they're different, different animals completely. 
And I think it's very important to note that only two patients out of 230 withdrew to do injection site reactions. And that's a very, very strong statement. Here's the pharmacokinetics. And um, because of time, I really can't go into this because I think this is kind of the most interesting thing as, as far as intramuscular, as far as figuring out what the right dose is, et cetera. But if you try to, try to understand what the target dose is for these drugs, I think we know that 30 milligrams is kind of a good dose. We know that 10 milligrams was a very good dose orally as well. So on the left side of this slide, if you look at the um, drug levels in the patients on both the Q4 week and the Q8 week, that they maintain drug levels that are clearly between the 10 and 30 milligram dose. So, so these, these are quite optimal. I think on the right side of the slide is the real pivoting uh, drug levels. And actually, we, we're still a little unsure of what the real pivoting target level should be. In the clinical trials for the uh, oral real pivoting, the mean, um, uh, the, the mean level of uh, patients who received uh, 25 milligrams a day or the mean trough level was about 80 or so uh, nanograms per ml. The 95% confident, the lower 95% confidence interval was about 50 nanograms per ml. So maybe that would be a better target, but certainly it's not like 16 nanograms per ml, which is the protein-adjusted IC, uh, uh, IC90 that uh, one can measure in, in, in vitro. Key slide, acceptability. And this is really, I, I think, something that we could take home. So if you look at the Q8 week or the Q4 week, the vast majority of patients, 97 to 96%, were very satisfied with their treatment. And when asked would they be willing to continue their treatment, the vast majority said yes. So Latte 2 is clearly a very successful study. It's relatively early on. This is 32-week data. There were two subjects who do, did meet protocol-defined virologic failure, but neither had drug resistance. The uh, injection was, uh, these injections were very well tolerated with the, the majority of injection site reactions being grade one to two with a median duration of three days. And based on these data, I think it's gonna be a little bit hard to figure out what's the uh, regimen that's gonna go into phase three. I talked, I talked to the folks at um, Viv and asked them for a definitive answer and they couldn't give me one. I think they're leaning toward the every four weeks because of the pharmacokinetics, but I'm not, I don't think that's been decided on yet. Personally, I think it would be better to have an every eight week regimen, and I think most people would agree that having to come in every four weeks for, for an injection might be a little too much. But again, it depends on the patient population, and maybe we can get into this in the question and answer. Let's move into um, prevention. Um, this is a slide that you've seen um, frequently during this meeting. I tried to, I wanted to keep it a bit regional and uh, 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 note that despite the fact there are a lot of people, there are uh, relatively low prevalence here compared to the numbers of individuals, you st uh, this, air, this area of the world, Asia and the Pacific, has the second highest numbers of new infections and therefore um, prevention is critical. You heard a fantastic talk from Bob Grant yesterday about um, daily oral prep and even intermittent you know, prep on demand, so I'm not gonna belabor this point. It's just that prep can be super effective, it can be relatively ineffective, and as Bob clearly pointed out, adherence seems to have a lot to do with that, although there may be some biology that also has something to do with it, and again, a, a discussion for another time. That said, we can learn from other fields. And this is a figure that was in the New England Journal of Medicine and Contraceptives. And um, in, the white, in, the, in the pale blue bars are the background pregnancy rates in teenage women and then women who are, uh, young girls who are white and black in the United States. And this is a, a group of young uh, women who were counseled in the St. Louis area about options for contraception, including long-acting reversible contraception. And note that in the darker blue bars, when they used long-acting reversible contraception, their pregnancy rates plummeted. And this really just highlights the fact that the more options one has, probably, the more effective one can be in preventing pregnancy and perhaps HIV. And again, might support the development of long-acting injectables as prevention. <laughs>
Now, one of the things I've learned in my in my life as, as a, a, a physician is you can come up with you can come up with the best science, but if people don't want it, it's not really worth anything. And so this is a study that Katrine Myers at Aaron Diamond did with a, a group in, a, in at New York University. So it's a group of 200 uh, men who have sex with men, mostly African American and Hispanic. So they're at uh, uh, thought to be at high risk for HIV infection, and they were asked a variety of questions, and this is just summarizing their willingness to use long-acting PrEP and their pr uh, preference for route of administration, and you can see that the vast majority were interested, and it's on the left side of the slide, and then when asked whether they would put oral, injection, etc., the vast majority preferred injectable. So it looks like there may be a demand or an interest in the target population for long-acting injectable PrEP. So first I'll talk about cabotegravir as a prevention. And the reason I'm gonna focus on cabotegravir, uh, there's a fair amount of data in both preclinically and then some data clinically, number one. Number two, it's gonna move forward. And uh, right now the other drug, Rilpivirine, may not move forward. So let me focus first on uh, cabotegravir. Um, Cabotegravir has been tested both preclinically and a variety of clinical studies. So uh, first I'll show you the preclinical studies just to show you that we tested a dose of cabotegravir in monkeys that was uh, relevant. So in red is what the drug levels were in the monkeys and black was what uh, an 800 milligram dose does in humans. The uh, drug has been given to rhesus macaques and pigtail macaques, and these animals are challenged intrarectally and intravaginally at various doses of, of SHIV-162P3, and the protection was very high level. So this preclinical data formed the rationale for moving into the clinic. We also did a threshold challenge study to try to identify clinically relevant concentrations of cabotegravir. And to make a long story short, we basically found that if the levels were above 3 XPAIC90, you had 100% protection. If they were above 1 XPAIC90, they were, uh, uh, you had about 97% protection. So um, with this in mind, we moved into a safety and acceptability and PK study in uninfected men. The dose rationale is based on what I showed you previously with the uh, model um, uh, supporting uh, Q 12-week dosing of an 800 milligram dose. The study was a very simple study, an oral lead-in, three intramuscular injections separated by 12 weeks with a lot of follow-up to assess injection site reactions and uh, how patient attitudes. Those uh, visits are not shown on this schematic. The study population was a low-risk population with a target of 60% men who have sex with men. High-risk men were excluded from the study, and assessment of risk was at screening, although there, were a, there was one infection during the study and one infection um, during the follow-up period. I should say that the one infection that occurred during the study was in a patient on placebo. Again, uh, so uh, uh, patients were um, uh, about 30 years old, predominantly white, matched very well for uh, um, uh, race, height, weight, BMI, et cetera. And um, I will just quickly tell you that uh, the drug was extremely well tolerated orally with 11 patients dropping out during the oral phase, seven due, due to adverse events. And all those adverse events were laboratory adverse events and they were mild to moderate adverse events, but because it was really the first experience with the long-acting injectable, people's threshold to remove patients from study was very low. During the, uh, inject during the injection phase, um, uh, uh, only seven patients were removed from study, and of those, four patients uh, uh, withdrew two to injection site reactions. Let me go to, into the injection site reactions in this uh, um, uh, um, study. First of all, remember now that in the treatment there was no placebo. In this, there's a placebo arm. So the act of injecting saline actually gives about a 27%, 25% or so of the patients have uh, injection site reactions that are evanescent for about two days. That said, 
almost 90% of the patients who received um, uh, cabotegravir as prevention had injection site reactions. So higher percentage than in the treatment studies, number one. If you look at the relative distributions, about half of them were mild, about 30% uh, uh, or 40% were moderate, and about another 10% were severe. So the patients who are getting these uh, injections as prevention are grading them as more severe or, or more painful than the patients who are getting actually more injections as treatment. And they actually lasted longer as well, 5.4 days. The pharmacokinetics were quite interesting. So shown on this slide are the, so the model is shown in orange and the observed is shown in green. And what you can see quite clearly is that the peaks are higher and the troughs are lower so that the drug actually underperformed pharmacokinetically. And the Q12 week dosing regimen does not appear to be op uh, 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 optimal. And it's likely that a Q8 week regimen will be uh, uh, more likely to be uh, 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 useful. And Bob showed you this yesterday, that the patients were extremely satisfied with their regimen and more likely to continue. Let me now move to um, uh, real pivorine. There have been a number of real pivorine early phase studied, studies done. The PK is extremely promising. You get very good levels in plasma, very good levels in cervical fluid, and very good levels in vaginal tissue. And when you do explant experiments, the drug basically does suppress viral replication, and that's no surprise. However, there was a, a, a patient who was dosed with the 300 milligrams, and uh, their drug profile was shown in blue, so they had a peak, and then their tail comes down. About 40 days after dosing, this particular uh, uh, individual had a new sexual partner, had unsafe sex, became infected with HIV, and you can see the relative rapid selection shown in orange for the uh, K101E mutation, which is a drug-resistant mutation to uh, real pivorine. And this is a problem with using a low barrier drug for prevention, particularly as a low acting agent. You have a long tail, you have HIV infection, and then you have low, you have tailing off levels of drug and you get resistance. So again, um, uh, one of the strikes against uh, real pivorine. This is um, a summary of a study being done by Ian McGowan at Pittsburgh. Just to summarize, he, again, he's demonstrated excellent penetration of drug in plasma, cervical vaginal fluid, and rectal tissue. However, when he did his explant experiments, he showed good suppression of uh, viral replication in uh, tissue, plasma, and uh, 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 rectal fluid, shown on the left side in orange, but he did not show it in cervical, vaginal uh, uh, tissue, et cetera raising the possibility that there are differences, again, between uh, rectal tissue and cervical tissue, et cetera. So where do we stand? Basically, um, I showed you the preclinical development for cabotegravir, which is basically macaque and CHIV-162P3, which is very, very uh, uh, promising. I showed you the tissue explant model for real pivorine, which is um, plus minus. Both drugs are likely to be dosed every two months. I think the barrier to resistance to cabotegravir is likely to be similar to cabotegravir and is likely to be high, but I'll, I'll say unknown because we still don't know. Real pivorine clearly has a low barrier to resistance. Um, something I did not mention, cabotegravir does not have cold chain requirement, and uh, uh, real pivorine does, and that's, again, another strike against it. So the current status is that cabotegravir is going to be developed further by the HPTN and uh, in both uh, men who have sex with men, transgender women, and then there's a study being written now for um, uh, um, uh, uh, high-risk women in South Africa, and currently there's no plan for um, uh, further development of real pivorine. So one of the messages to leave you with, I've told you about all the wonderful things, beware of the tail, and I think this is something that we have to pay attention to as we develop long-acting injectables. Remember, we're going to thinking about tailoring these therapies for patients who are hard to reach with oral therapy. They may be the same patients that are hard to reach, hard to retain, and hard to find. So we really have to use these drugs carefully. And number two, not only are we going to have injectables, but now people are talking about implantables. And again, so we're borrowing from contraception. 
where we may have long-acting antiretrovirals that cannot last a month, two months. We're talking about six months to a year. And that might be really quite revolutionary in the prevention field. So thank you for your attention, and thank you to everybody who contributed to my talk.